Hello and welcome to class 11 of our plasma survey course. If you remember in lecture 10, we talked about the Hamiltonian method for plasma physics, <clears throat> which in um, practice is pretty much Hamiltonian treatment of dynamics from classical mechanics. And we did see an application to the mirror case, which uh, we had treated uh, briefly in terms of uh, single particle motion and the adiabatic invariant. <clears throat> we then said that adiabatic invariants are also a concept that's mediated from classical mechanics and how they come from uh, the action integral j <clears throat> that's an integral over uh, closed or an oscillation for a periodic system of p generalized momentum in the q generalized coordinate and if the motion is not quite, but almost periodic, this quantity is what is called an adiabatic invariant, and it's not quite constant, but it's almost constant. Now, we can uh, think back of the uh, about the motion of a single particle in um, a mirror field <clears throat> and we can realize that there are three types of motion that are about periodic okay i'm not going to try to draw a picture but i'm at least going to type something about this type of motion. That is the quasi periodic motion. <clears throat> and the first one is uh, the gyration around the magnetic field lines. Gyration, or if you prefer, cyclotron motion. And uh, this is what will give us the first adiabatic invariant, which we often just call the adiabatic invariant, as we have already discussed. The second type of motion is um, the bounce motion <clears throat> that occurs because of the mirror reflection points. As we've discussed in not much detail, really, a particle moves from a region of lower magnetic field to a region of higher magnetic field gets reflected so bounces off and starts moving back if the machine as it normally is the case has two regions of high field 
on um, opposite sides, <clears throat> the particle will get to the opposite end, bounce again, and move back and forth. So that bounce motion is, at least from <clears throat> the point of view of the simplest um, description we can give a periodic motion in reality then we have to take into account drifts but to lowest order in um, the frequency of the of the bounce which is called the bounce frequency that's also a, a periodic motion And therefore, it will create a second adiabatic invariant. I wish I knew of a trick if there is one to not have these things appear. This is going to be called the second adiabatic invariant <clears throat> or you may also find it under the name of bounce invariant from um, the motion that's causing the the invariance <clears throat> now the the third one is actually due to the drifts if you work out the curvature and drift you'll see that <clears throat> it will create a motion that is in the azimuthal direction the direction of symmetry and that motion is also periodic it's just a motion sort of in a circle what that means is that again i'm going to have an adiabatic invariant coming from that motion And this is going to be called the third adiabatic invariant. Now, after some considerations, I've decided not to go into any more detail than this. You can see the detailed description in our textbook <clears throat> that it's very easy to calculate the, the action integral for the first adiabatic invariant so I encourage you to, to do it and you'll see that that action integral is um, proportional to the magnetic moment up to constants. And that's where the relation comes from in terms of um, classical mechanics description. For the other invariants, the integrals may be more complicated, but the concept is exactly the same. A couple of things to mention, bounce invariant, and well start from the bounce invariant that also exists for fusion experiments such as tokamax that is the description of a mirror field is not an end to itself it, it gets applied what the results that we're obtaining get applied 
apply to more complicated geometries like the tokamak geometry. This bounds invariant is going to be present in uh, tokamak 2. We're not uh, going, probably not going to encounter it again, but I wanted to emphasize that it is there. It is also there for uh, other geometries and other systems, such as the magnetosphere. In the magnetosphere, there is a dipole field which is stronger closer to the poles of the earth and weaker farther away that's um, pretty much the prescription for a mirror field so that bounce invariant also appears in the magnetosphere and so does the drift invariant long story <clears throat> short we are describing the uh, these properties of charged particles in a plasma under very simplifying assumptions for the geometry of the field but the results we're obtaining are in general applicable to more complicated geometries so the message is we're keeping this simple as we can so we can understand the math and, and deal with it but don't get misled by the simplifying assumptions we're making for learning purposes this is not the only magnetic mirrors are not the only place where all of this happens indeed <clears throat> the Hamiltonian method is going to be useful in many other systems the three adiabatic invariants are going to appear in other systems as well so always come back to the simplifying assumption we're making here to understand the motion the physics the math more easily but always be aware that that's not the only place where all this can happen. And with this, we're going to close our discussion of these invariants, and we're going to close our discussion of um, Hamiltonian treatment uh, of plasmas. This was very brief. This is a very big field. It can teach us very many things about uh, the plasma but again this being a survey we can only do so much and we have so much we want to talk about now the next topic that appears in our textbook and in uh, many courses is the topic of waves which is a very important topic we'll spend some time on the discussion of waves but there is a um, bit of a technical issues moving from the description of a single particle motion to the description of waves that for a wave i'm actually going to need a medium i'm going to need some type of continuum which is of course going to be an approximation of a very very large number of discrete particles <clears throat> but all we have done so far is talk about one single particle and the collision between two particles what we need is a general description for the collective behavior of the plasma and that's going to come from one of two options let me type uh, correctly 
what we can do is um, use what's called the kinetic treatment. or use what is called the fluid treatment. Now the kinetic treatment is similar <clears throat> to what you see in um, statistical mechanics. Is, is the description and calculation of the behavior of the distribution function for my species ions or electrons, I'm going to have one for each, while the fluid treatment deals with averages. It's going to tell me things about densities, pressures, velocities. The kinetic treatment is um, more detailed, but it's also more challenging mathematically, and it may also be less physically intuitive, make it harder to interpret the meaning of um, the whatever results we're obtaining. On the other hand, the fluid treatment is more physically intuitive. It's closer to us. But for both of them, really, we have to figure out the relation between these and the single particle motion. So what it, this is easier for the kinetic uh, treatment. The kinetic treatment is just the collective motion of each single particle. We understand how one particle is moving. We apply that description to each and every particle, and then get to the distribution function. You've certainly seen this in um, statistical mechanics. And I don't know if you have seen this before, but I will not assume that you have. From the kinetic treatment, you can take moments of the, what's going to be the Boltzmann equation in, whatever form it assumes, and obtain fluid equations. So that, that is a very rigorous and precise process. We know how to do it. But you may also know that the fluid treatment of, uh, well, fluids, not plasmas, has been in um, use before <clears throat> we learn the math of the kinetic or statistical treatment of uh, fluids, <clears throat> which means that somehow people figure this out without using the kinetic treatment. Now, I've come to un understand that actually fluid dynamics is not a standard course in uh, everybody's background. So I will not assume that you've ever seen fluid dynamics. What I'm going to do is um, to show you how fluid dynamics equations are, are how fluid equations are derived starting from physical intuition, this should be pretty straightforward, but it's going to take us a little bit of time. And then we're going to have a good, understandable, hopefully convincing foundation for our fluid, fluid treatment of the plasmas. And we'll take it from there to proceed with our um, learning about the physics of plasmas. Now, oops, actually, 
let me put it in this writing. <clears throat> This is going to be perhaps a little bit more than physical intuition. There is some math involved and we're not going to take any, um, play any dirty tricks. Okay, then let's assume we have our mm, plasma could be a cylinder, could be a, a torus for fusion or something like this where my axis of symmetry is going to be here. And I'm going to take now a fluid element inside that plasma. Okay, well, I'll just write it in a black. Just remember that we don't, I don't have easy access to that the red color, but understandable enough, I think. Now, what is interesting about the fluid element is that fluid element actually needs to satisfy two requirements that are somewhat in uh, oppositions. <laughs> My fluid element needs to be small enough there you go. <clears throat> to capture the small scale behavior of the plasma. Um, let me just call it the interesting behavior, whatever we are trying to figure out. And it needs to be large enough to make averages meaningful. What I'm trying to do is to take averages over my volume and uh, <clears throat> those cap averages need to be meaningful that means that i need to have enough particles in there if i pick a volume that's too small then i may have sometimes one particle in it sometimes two and that's going to change my quantities by a huge amount over short short amounts of time. That means that my average is not going to give me a reasonable evaluation or interpretation of the behavior of the system. On the other hand, uh, if I have enough particles, <clears throat> then the variation or fluctuation in the behavior of a any single one of them is not going to affect my system too terribly much. <clears throat> so here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start by defining a density and that's going to be N with subscript. E, let's see if I can make the subscript. Shouldn't be too hard, right? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, where this is not a subscript anymore. And I'm going to give a definition of that as uh, the number of particles in the volume. divided by the volume, the volume of what? Of my fluid element, what I decided is the volume of my fluid element. Oops, sorry. Ended up under the keyboard. That's my definition. Now, what about the subscript that I put in there? I'm specifically thinking of electrons. Why? Well, why not? I'm thinking of electrons, but I could be thinking of uh, ions. It doesn't really make um, any difference to speak of the treatment is going to be the same, but of what I want to be aware of is that I'm going to have, because of quasi neutrality, I expect to have the same number or close to the same number of ions and electrons in any fluid element, but the equations that describe the motion of the electrons and of the ions, even though they're the same, they describe the motion of different quantities. In other words, if I have a velocity of the electrons, that's not going to necessarily tell me anything about the ions. It's going to tell me how the density of the electrons is going to change. And then that's going to be related to how the density of the ions changes through the whatever mean of communication ions and electrons have. Well, <clears throat> this I can uh, run out of space. Um, let me write it um, the next uh, line here. <clears throat> Um, okay, it's Microsoft making no sense. That's we're pretty used to it. Okay, this quantity and sub e is going to be the number of particles, which I'm going to call capital N sub e, what I have above, divided by delta v. That's the symbol I'm going to use for the volume. I'm going to use delta v to remind myself when that this is not the volume of the plasma. This is the volume of the fluid element. If I see capital V, I may get confused and think, okay, this is the volume of the whole plasma. No, it's the volume of the element. And uh, you have seen this in um, homework, this with the appropriate normalization is the integral of the distribution function of the electrons in uh, dV. With, depending on how you define the distribution function, there may be a numerical factor here in front. So the <clears throat> first expression with a number of particles divided by the volume tells me pick your volume, take a, a picture, go in your picture and count all the particles. The second one is going from the continuous to the smooth and description, sorry, from the discrete to the continuous and smooth description. And that transition, as you've learned in calculus one probably, <clears throat> 
makes sense when capital N is big enough. In a, a similar way, I'm going to define uh, the velocity of um, my fluid element <clears throat> as the average of the velocity of the particles. See if I can make this work. So what I want here is um, the sum of the particle velocities divided by the volume again. of the fluid element, almost. Oh, and this, just to be clear, is a vector. So this is going to be equal to velocity of particle one plus velocity of particle two plus velocity of particle three let's say i have ten thousand of them so just give me a, a couple of years and i'll be done writing okay. sum of all of them divided again by delta v um well, wow, sorry. I made a logic leap and wrote something that's completely stupid. Let me fix it. Logical leap. What I meant to write here is that I need to divide by the number of particles, I'm making the average of the particle velocity velocities. Okay, and this also I can express as an integral. One over n sub v of the integral over all space of v vector distribution function in dv. Now this average velocity, <clears throat> I should name it, again, only contains information on the average. behavior of my electrons it doesn't tell me anything about um, the uh, each individual electron it just tells me the, the average so if i know what this average is i don't know if um, the electrons have very different velocities and this is the average or they're sort of all moving with this velocity usually And in a similar way, <clears throat> we'll see it in a moment, or maybe in the next lecture, you can um, obtain similar quantities, similar expressions for pressures, temperatures, and um, other things. Now, um, What you have to be mindful of in here is 
how big my volume is going to be. And that's going to depend on your system. <clears throat> that is for magnetosphere, the Jupiter magnetosphere, let's say, some size is going to make sense for a fusion device, some different size is going to make sense. Remember what we said about the, <clears throat> statistical description. This is going to make sense if I have enough particles. What enough particles is maybe a matter of taste, but in general, you can be pretty sure one is not enough and probably 10 is not enough either. You want them to be maybe in the thousand. Now, I'm only going to give you one example, and I'm going to ask you to perhaps figure a different one out. And the example, sorry, that's what I do. The example I'm going to give you is to be for a fusion plasma. Then, I'm just going to type now. And sub E is going to be of the order of 10 to the 20 meters to the minus three. So I'm going to have 10 to the 20 particles in a cubic meter. Then, and um, let me call it the size of the of the machine or the experiment or whatever. Is going to be or the order of the meter. Then I can say, well, if I take Delta X to be, let's try ten to the minus five meters. I probably have a good resol spatial resolution for whatever is happening in my plasma. I have 10 to the five elements next to each other in one meter. And that's the size of, of my machine. And let's say I take the same delta x in each direction. I make my fluid element. Let me go back up here, a little cube. I'm deeply impressed by the beauty of my drawing here. I'm going to say this is like a cube and therefore my delta V is going to be order that delta X, the size of delta V is going to be delta X cube or 10 to the minus 15 meters to the minus three. And this is not, terribly hard math that gives me that the number of particles 
in a a fluid element of, of that size is going to be about 10 to the 5 which we can accept to be large enough to justify a statistical treatment to, to justify our integrals and averages okay that settles one concern that you may have there is another concern that may occur to you especially if you're familiar with fluid mechanics and let's see what that is okay here is the problem you may know from a fluid mechanics that a fluid element is a concept that makes sense because of collisions what makes a fluid element uh, meaningful in a, a fluid is that each particle in that fluid element will uh, not be able to escape the volume the fluid element is originally defining very easily because as it travels it will collide very often with the other particles in the fluid element and therefore in on uh, average will move very slowly with respect to the motion of the collective fluid element however we have seen that in plasmas collisionality goes down with the temperature as the temperature goes up that means that especially in fusion plasmas many behaviors many properties are essentially collisionless the plasma is not dominated by collisions and that's the exact opposite to what we should have to properly define a fluid element the question then is how how does the fluid description still make sense or does it it turns out that this still works and the reason why it works is that what matters for the fluid description is not what gives the coherence to the fluid element but rather that there is a coherence well is there such a thing for our uh, fusion plasmas the answer is yes and that's given by the magnetic field this may be uh, puzzling but we have actually learned that each particle is not going to be able to move freely across magnetic fields therefore the motion across magnetic fields the perpendicular motion with respect to the direction of the magnetic field is tightly constrained for each single particle in the same way as it was for each single particle in a fluid element for a fluid not a plasma then we can actually treat the plasma as a fluid in the same exact way but only perpendicular to the magnetic field we say that the magnetic field takes the role of collisions but that only works in the direction perpendicular to the magnetic field in the direction parallel to the magnetic field if you want a proper collision sorry a proper model of the plasma you'll have to resort to kinetic treatment there are ways around this the hybrid treatments one thing that works uh, to our advantage in fusion fusion systems is that very often the motion parallel to the magnetic field is not that important what really matters is the motion perpendicular to the magnetic field and that we can describe with fluid models but still you have to be mindful of what the limits of applicability of the model are at any rate the the idea of uh, <clears throat> a fluid uh, 
element it does make sense because there is something in uh, my system that gives coherence to the fluid element itself. Now, the next thing I'm going to do, may not be able to finish today, is to give you an idea, maybe a, well, let's try to be careful with um, this first equation that we derived, the equation for conservation of mass. Perhaps we can uh, move more quickly with a conservation of momentum. I'm going to assume this much that you're all familiar with Lagrangian coordinates. And that's what we're going to use. And then we're going to transform back. To Eulerian coordinates. This is pretty standard. That's that's the way. It's just the way that works best. Here is that how we're going to proceed. We're going to start at time t equals zero. And look at what the number what the number of particles in in um, my volume, my fluid volume is. The number is going to be n, which is going to be equal to the density times the volume. Okay, what happened to the, the subscript? Here I'm going to be generic. This could be ions or electrons. We are going to mostly be talking about the electrons just for clarity, but it could be any species. And uh, for my volume, that's going to be equal to some cube, delta x, delta y, delta z. I can uh, start assuming that they're all equal, but then let's see what happens. They may actually change in different ways. So here is um, how my it's not quite what I wanted to do. Sorry about that. Go away. My fluid element here, I'm going to represent it just in two dimensions. Looks like a t equals zero. Then it moves somehow. 
and at a later time it may look a little different in uh, in the frame of reference of lamb this is some time t1 greater than zero however i'm going to assume that that fluid element conserves its identity that means that the change of number of particles in uh, the fluid element is zero. The number of particles in the fluid element does not change. That is my definition of a fluid element. And that's why I'm using Lagrangian, the Lagrangian description because that's not going to be true in Eulerian description. But now we want to go back to um, Eulerian system. And uh, in fact, this change must hold at any time. That means that the derivative of n with respect to t is invariably going to be equal to zero now since oops, n big n is equal to little n times delta v then the n over dt is going to be equal to delta v times the derivative of little n with respect to t plus n times the derivative of delta v over dt. That was the idea. I'm uh, in, in my picture where I'm showing that the shape of my volume, the volume of my fluid element is changing a little bit. And um, in general, the volume may change. Now let's work on the last term. That's going to be equal uh, because of the definition of Delta V that we have up here. Delta Y, Delta Z times the derivative of Delta X over DT plus cyclic permutations, delta x, delta z, times the derivative of delta y, dt, plus dx, delta x, delta z, um, no, delta y, derivative of delta z over dt. Okay, now how do we evaluate um, this uh, these derivatives? Let's see, we should have time at least to do this much. 
let me try to make a, a little plot here. So this length is going to be delta x. And we are time t. And then I'm going to have, could be the same shape. It's never going to look exactly the same, but something like this. Here are my coordinates x1, index 2. Here my fluid element, remember the averages. Uh, let me make proper arrows here. One. The fluid element is moving with the average velocity that I introduced earlier. In particular, what I'm seeing here is the motion in the x direction, that's u sub x. And that's going to be calculated at the point x2. And this is going to be u sub x calculated at x1. Then if I go compare with theoretically straight lines, what happened here is that I'm going to have, no, no, I don't want to skip up. Oops, wrong pen. This distance is going to be u sub x calculated at x1 times delta t. And here I'm at time t plus dt. And this distance, the one on the right, in general may be different if you to so u, ux at x2 is different from ux at x1. So this is going to be ux at x2 times dt. Now, the center of my fluid element is going to be identified by the coordinate x. And therefore, my left side is going to be at position x minus delta x over 2. And similarly, my right side is going to be at x plus delta x over 2. Okay, we're almost there. Now I'm going to call this length delta x prime, delta x new, and let's see what it's going to look like. That's going to be equal to delta x plus u x x two minus u x x1 times dt and uh, 
without uh, many further steps, t is going to be equal to delta x plus dux dx times delta x dt. Or the derivative of delta x over dt, that is delta x prime minus delta x divided by dt is nothing else than dux dx times delta x. And you get the same thing for all the other ones. Okay, we have time to finish this. Then the n over dt, which we said was equal to n. Oh, sorry, let me do it this way. Delta v dn dt plus n derivative of delta v dt. Let me put this in writing. That the same thing is going to work for y and z. I don't need to do it three times, I hope. So this is going to be equal putting pieces together to delta v, which I can collect in front, times b and dt plus n dux dx plus n du n uh, du x dy plus n du z dz which will look familiar is delta v times dn over dt plus n divergence of u. And is equal to zero. Okay, uh, we just need a second for the last step, but I don't want to make this too long, so we'll finish this in the next lecture. Thank you, and see you next time.